Hi and welcome to the Virtual Instructions podcast. From creativity to slang and modern drama to psychopathy, we'll showcase a concise and original introduction to a wide range of subjects, wherever your curiosity may take you. So here is today's very short introduction. I'm Esti Wieding and I am Professor of Developmental Psychopathology at the Division of Psychology and Language Sciences in University College London. I'm also adjunct faculty at Yale University School of Medicine Child Study Center. The title of my book is Psychopathy, a very short introduction. Psychopathy is a personality disorder and it's characterized by profound lack of empathy for others and guilt for um, bad deeds that you may have done. It can also be characterized by manipulation of others and is typically involving antisocial behavior as well. And this antisocial behavior can be very calculated and it does not always mean that you get criminal charges. It may also be antisocial behavior in the community, such as shafting your colleagues in the workplace, spreading rumors or treating your romantic partner uh, very badly. So it's this very problematic constellation of traits involving antisocial behavior and, and this inability to feel for others, feel for other people's distress, feel for their joy and to feel guilt that really, really characterize individuals with psychopathy. I first got interested in this subject when I attended lectures during my undergraduate degree. And I had a lecturer at the time called James Blair, who was one of the foremost leaders in the world in psychopathy research. And he was telling us about the most recent neuroscientific findings relating to psychopathy, but also describing these individuals and how they really seem to be quite different from the rest of us in how they were feeling, how they were behaving. So I got really fascinated about this condition where individuals almost seem to be void of some aspects of common humanity. And it seemed so difficult to understand that there could be people who could just exploit other people to their own ends and actually feel very little guilt about doing so. And that seemed so alien to me that I got fascinated in trying to understand what, why are people like this and why do they develop this way? But also, is there something that you can do to prevent this sort of disorder from emerging? There are a number of key aspects that everyone, I think, should know about psychopathy. First of all, we've got quite a bit of data that can help us explain why individuals with psychopathy behave the way that they do. So we know from experimental psychology studies and also from neuroimaging studies that these individuals do not seem to be experiencing emotions in quite the same way as the rest of us. And in particular, they seem to have difficulty in automatically resonating with other people's distress or with other people's joy. And this lack of empathy for both negative and positive feelings, we think explains why these people are capable of causing hurt for other people in order to gain something. And why also they don't appear to form normal attachment relationships, normal romantic relationships, where you really show care and concern for other people. We also know from experimental and neuroimaging studies that these individuals do not have the optimal machinery for decision making. So they are relatively poor at making a connection between something that they have done and the consequences of that action. And we think that the antisocial, the poorly planned, the unempathetic behavior that we see in these individuals arises because the normal breaks that we have to stop us from behaving in ways that cause harm to others are not functioning very well in these individuals. So typically most of us, when we see someone else in distress, that makes us automatically feel bad. We don't have to think about, oh, I'm going to crank up this empathy now. It's something that we feel whether we like it or not. And that is a very strong deterrent that stops us from doing something unpleasant to other people on a regular basis. But these individuals seem to have those breaks removed. They also, as I said, are not good at computing the connection between what they've just done and the outcome of that action, which means that they may behave in impulsive ways or in ways that look poorly planned simply 
because they are just not able to make the same computations as the rest of us in terms of the likely consequences of their behavior, either for themselves or, or for other people. And finally, their inability to share in the joy of other people and share in the positive emotions that typically make us bond with other people and feel as one with other people also likely means that they don't develop the same deep, caring relationships and the rest of us do. And this sort of toxic constellation then leads these individuals to be at a very high risk of doing things that are harmful for other people when they seek to do things that are good for themselves or pleasurable for themselves. We are starting to better understand why some people develop this way. Obviously, nobody gets personality disorder like psychopathy as a birthday present when they turn 18. So there are signs and traits that are in place early on in development that cause parents and clinical psychologists and teachers a degree of worry and which, which indicate that a, a child or an adolescent may be at the risk trajectory where they could develop into adult psychopaths. Now, these sorts of signs include this inability to feel empathy for other people and guilt, difficulty in taking responsibility for your own actions, impulsive decision-making for planning, and also this atypical affiliation with other people, failure to, to develop these normal, warm relationships with your parents and with your peers and uh, with other important people in your life. Now, of course, children are not destined to become psychopaths if they have this sort of constellation of traits. There is a lot of good longitudinal data showing that only a subset of individuals who have these traits go on to become adult psychopaths. And this is extremely hopeful and really motivates us to get better and better in understanding the risk factors and how we might uh, prevent them from developing into a full adult disorder. But there's also no doubt that there are some children who are at higher risk and we really ought to pay attention to these children and uh, try and help them, but also protect others from the harmful behaviours that they often display. Data from my group and others have shown that these sorts of traits are relatively highly heritable. So there are genetic influences that make some individuals more prone to developing these traits. That doesn't mean that they are destined to become that way, but it means that they have a higher risk in much the same way as some people are genetically more vulnerable to developing anxiety or heart disease or high uh, blood pressure. But environmental influences clearly matter. And there's also very, very nice data from adoption studies showing that even children who are at the genetic risk may develop very uh, normally if they have very warm, very consistent parenting. Now, of course, the challenge in many biological families who have children with these difficult temperaments is that parents may share some of these features themselves. And this is one of the things that we think is important to consider when we try and think about how to prevent and how to treat children who are at high risk, because it may be that when you work with them and when you work with the families, there are many of the same problems occurring in multiple family members. And that will obviously make working with people more challenging. I think uh, in the future, we will need a lot more work to get a finer grained picture of the both of the biological vulnerabilities and also how environmental factors may either potentiate those biological vulnerabilities or offer protection against them. And we need to think about how we can best put those environmentally protective factors in place at multiple points of development to ensure that as few people as possible develop psychopathy in adulthood. I also think that there would be merit in trying to educate people about the disorder and the kind of behavior patterns that come with it so that we can perhaps make people more alert and ensure that people are less likely to fall victim of individuals with high levels of psychopathic traits. I hope this podcast has sparked your interest in psychopathy and that you might enjoy reading the book. Thank you for listening to the Very Short Instructions podcast. You can subscribe to our podcast on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify and Stitcher to receive new episodes directly to your podcast feed. All of our episodes, new and old, can also be found on SoundCloud and YouTube at OUP Academic. Mm-hmm.